Bienvenidos sean todos ustedes. Welcome everybody to this special transmission. Yes, I know that it's a little bit earlier than usual, but that's because we have a very particular program uh, that with a very special guest that allow me to introduce uh, to you right now. And I'm very honored uh, because he's he has been a great influence because he's one of the few writers that I really enjoy that really analyzes the media of comics. Uh, you know that you can uh, get a lot of people doing reviews, and I mean, I, I do that too, but I really enjoy when, when you can uh, talk in this, in, in this occasion with somebody who actually uh, likes to get inside the medium and analyze uh, this mean of expression. So let's welcome Hassan. Has, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for having me on the show. Excellent, excellent. Uh, thanks uh, for accepting the invitation uh, for this. This this has been something that we have been uh, sort of planning for for some time, and I'm really <laughs> glad that we finally got the chance to to have this conversation. So thanks again for for accepting. <laughs> yeah, sorry for uh, it's been a while. It's been, but um, yeah, I've been looking forward to it. I think it's gonna be good fun. Excellent, excellent. And uh, for me in particular, I, I believe that it it, it has been uh, perhaps a, a mistake for my part because I have already uh, got the chance to talk with some people that you have been collaborating, like uh, Mark Russell or uh, Zach and Lonnie, for example, in mm -hmm. some of the titles that uh, you have been working in there. So just, just to, to give a little bit more of um, background to the people who are watching uh, right now, who are joining us in Twitch, uh, where we're live at this very moment. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about the interest that you have in, in into comics and well, right now, uh, writing about comics, writing in comics and working, analyzing comics. So something that you want to share? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I guess if people have uh, heard of me before, it's uh, through Strip Pound Naked, which is a YouTube series that I do, um, kind of just like sort of analyzing sort of storytelling approaches in comics, that sort of thing. Um, and kind of off the back of that, I started uh, Panel by Panel magazine, which is um, just like a monthly digital magazine uh, where we, we sort of like take a feature comic book uh, and then kind of analyze it from different areas, do some sort of long long interviews with the creative team and stuff like that. Um, and kind of get stuck into it from various different angles with loads of different uh, really, really good critics writing sort of, you know, various different sort of approaches. Uh, based around that comic. Um, and uh, also, yeah, I, I letter comics, I suppose, is the other the other sort of facet of my time. Uh, <laughs> so I've, I've sort of uh, lettering stuff like Red Sonja and Exo Man of War and Quantum and Woody and um, Undone by Blood and just all sorts. Of, the thing with lettering is you kind of, you end up doing loads, so that it's a, a broad mix of stuff. <laughs> yeah, 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 and it's it's quite quite a nice mix of work. Uh, as uh, for example, some of the titles that uh, I have been enjoying a lot it's is the run that you have been uh, working with uh, with Mark uh, in, in in Red Sonia, for example. And it's something particular because, for example, um, this morning I was reading in in one uh, in. Animal Politico, which is a publication, well, uh, a web page uh, uh, here in Mexico that focuses in, in politics, in news, in, in culture. And for example, there was a, an interesting uh, story there that uh, how people uh, in Mexico, at least, uh, the, the, the numbership of people reading comics has been um, fading. Uh, has been mm -hmm. coming down. It's perhaps about 10% of the population actually reads comics in here. Obviously, it depends on the background that you have, the socio-economical uh, place where you are located, and, and mm -hmm. if, if you have access to these kinds of means. But it was interesting in, in, the, in this case because when we're talking about reading comics, uh, for some people, it's kind um, of peculiar because they think that perhaps if they have pictures, you are not quite reading. So uh, but, uh, we know that uh, comics is it's, it's, uh, both a collaborative collaborative medium and also for reading you don't only have to read uh, use the letters and uh, that's interesting because for example that's part of the work that you do uh, can you tell us about uh, for example in this case the, the kind of elements that you have to take into account when you, when you are working lettering a book yeah i think that's a this is one of the things i think is interesting about um comics because we we as a society we're much more trained to, to kind of like read um, text, right? Like we have, you spend a lot of your time at school learning how to kind of decipher language and understand language. Because for most of us, that's our, that's kind of our main method of communication throughout the day, right? Like words are the, are the things that we kind of use to communicate. Uh, and a lot of what we uh, sort of interact with in you know, newspapers, novels, uh, is words. And so it's, in, it's important, it's very important to, to kind of like understand how language works and how to layer it and how to imply things through through language and meaning but visuals are just have just as much storytelling capacity 
uh, but we're not we're not like tra- this is I've gone way off a- as a tangent, but they're not. <laughs> uh you know we're not we're not trained to read visuals in the same way that we are the text so you know if you go to like an art gallery or whatever and you look at an image we don't we're not trained to kind of understand and decipher what that image means in the same capacity that we would be if we were given a couple of sentences on a wall for example even though what that artwork contains is arguably a similar depth you know a, a similar amount of sort of information and a narrative as a as a paragraph could have or, you know potentially even more so it's i always find that's quite interesting that we sort of understand visuals to kind of because there's always this kind of standard thing of like you know comics are for kids or whatever because it, because they're not because they've got pictures in so it's an mm-hmm. easy it's an easier read um but i think a big part of that is the fact that we're just we're just not trained technically to to kind of read images in the same way that we are to read text um which was only the start of your question so <laughs> the <laughs> the actual question you asked me so the the thing about i think the thing about lettering is what you're well, what i'm trying to do is kind of look at the 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 book as a whole so it's not just it's not just genre or or story but it's also approach from the artist which i think is what makes lettering really interesting because yes you're trying to match the genre like i don't want to letter a a horror comic book with a kind of fun bouncy font Mm -hmm. um that that makes it feel you know that harkens back to kind of like child child stories or like kids stories or whatever Um, but at the same time it's not just that that's not the only consideration because I also want to look at what the artist is doing and kind of try and make it feel like the artist also did the lettering. In, in much the same way that I think colorists do with their colors. They don't they mm-hmm. don't want to make it look like someone else colored the book. They kind of want to make the whole thing feel uniform. Um, so that's what you're kind of doing with lettering is I'm kind of trying to do the emotional moments that I need to hit. The, you know, the strength of the balloon, if someone's shouting, the kind of burst, the right kind of burst, all that kind of sort of narrative stuff. But also there's the kind of, aesthetic choice as well that you have to kind of consider i think um so it's it's it's, it's that sort of weird balance between narrative uh, and aesthetic kind of design and narrative does that was that was that the question yeah and, that, actually, I right? yeah, yeah. And, and actually that that brings us to the the topic of this conversation because uh, when we're talking about comic book narrative uh we have to take into account all the different elements and for example i'm going to quote uh or uh, show some of the um, of the scenes from one of your uh, videos analyzing this case frank whiteley's silent storytelling uh where perhaps mm-hmm. you can say that in this particular page of uh, new x-men uh, he uh, perhaps he's cheating a little bit because he, you are actually using text in uh in one issue that was supposed to be only uh, actions in in this particular right. case uh, but the, once again uh the, the way that it's been shown it's like okay words are, are part of the story words are, are part of the narrative words are not just dialogues that you are supposed to read and uh, there you have different kind of phenomena i believe that uh grand morrison itself used it in one of the stories in multiversity where he asked the questions that when you are reading something what's the voice that you are actually uh, hearing your, inside your head and these are some mm-hmm. of the different elements that you can uh, take from the page because the voice that you are listening for example if you are i don't know um reading a comic a comic book that's based on uh, a movie or a cartoon or something that you have at least a reference in the audiovisual right. medium you can get the voice of the actor inside your head but for example it's not the same ta- the same way when you are actually uh, working with a different kind of elements so some that's something that the voice you have to adjust in this case to you as a reader to, to to what's in your head and in this case you as as an uh, as an artist in the way that the the creator the writer the the artist are intending for the reader to to have it uh one question for example because I, I'm going to say something that uh, might sound uh, really dumb. And I also have one friend who is working right now in, in, in Marvel as a letterer. Um, right. And uh, we usually make fun of him in, 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 in a fun, in, well, at the fun and perhaps for us, saying that, well, you, you are only writing, so uh, what's, what's your job? You are just pretty much selecting the font that you are going to use for the comic. And I know that that's not the only thing that you have to do, but that's perhaps some of the ways that you can simplify in there. The actual question that I wanted to ask you, uh, do you have a discussion in this case with the artists that you are uh, collaborating about the way that you are going to represent the, the, the words, the dialogues and the different elements in the page? Or uh, it's more like something that they trust you? Uh, how is the, the, the process uh, that you're working in there? It, dep- it, depends on the, it depends on the book. But like mm-hmm. I think uh, but the typical way is usually like my, I, I'll usually put together a couple of different approaches as to what I think will work. Um, so once we get, you know, once I've got a handful of pages or whatever, uh, I'll I'll take a look through the script. I'll take a look at the pages, and I'll come to I'll come up with a couple of different styles. So they're usually kind of like 
the the safe style, which is kind of there's something that you know will always work. Um, you can have something that's really clean. This it's almost like you're talking about Marvel. It's kind of like a very Marvel house style, right? You can mm -hmm. the, you can the, you can take the Marvel style and you can apply it to basically any kind of any kind of comic, and it will work. It'll be legible. It'll be readable. It won't get in the way. Um, but I think that's for me that I, I feel like kind of hitting that. That's kind of like the baseline for lettering. Really, is you want the thing to be legible uh, mm -hmm. and to not get in the way of the story. And I think that's where you. That's where I want to start from, rather than where I want to necessarily hit. Um, and so for me, it's like I kind of you know I want to put a style that works like that, but I also want to look and, and kind of push it just a little bit further. Um, maybe maybe it's, you know it might be a case of making a custom a custom brush for the balloon strokes. Mm -hmm. I do that on quite a few things. Um, sometimes it requires a very specific uh, style. I'm thinking like Undone by Blood, which was mm. uh, written by by Zach and Lonnie and, and drawn by Sammy Cavella. Um, they in that they have this kind of like flashback sequence, uh, and then they also have kind of like a, a novel within the comic book sequence. And so it's not it wasn't dictated in the script, but for that I kind of felt like I wanted to do some novelization to the the design of the of the captions for those sequences. So for that, it was kind of like I pulled down some textures of old paper and found some kind of like old print font style stuff. Um, and so you kind of, there's like, as I say, there's kind of like the, there's, there's the design element of it. Like, what do I want to communicate via the design? So in the case of Undone by Blood, it was very much like I want to communicate the idea of uh, this novelization. So when we go into the into the sort of the cowboy stuff that you can see from the cover, you kind of got like the the, the 70s story, which is the, the stuff at the top. And then you've got the kind of like cowboy novel at the bottom and so the cowboy stuff i wanted to make it feel like you were kind of almost reading a, a novel and what you were seeing was just the the images you were imagining as you were reading the novel and so to do that i wanted to make the text feel like uh, novel text rather than kind of comic book lettering um so yeah that's so you can there's that all the stuff you can kind of communicate through design there's that there's also as i say kind of matching the art the art style so like the 70s style of undone by blood i, I um used uh, one of the comic craft fonts called Maladroit, which was kind of like a, it's kind of like a thick, slightly sort of um, looser kind of like font style to kind of match the art and stuff. So there, as I say, it's like, it's like design, design is like a big part of it, but it's also the part that isn't necessarily the job once you've got going. So once you've got going, the job then becomes kind of making it easy to read, making sure that the balloons are in the right um, order and the right spacing. And that they're not going to cross over each other. They're not going to be confusing for the reader. That sort of thing. Um, you know, there's there's loads of little mini mini decisions that you kind of make on each page that are around legibility and then narrative. Uh, on top of that, so does this make sense? Does it read in the right order? But also, can I place this in a way that kind of adds something to the impact? Can I design it in a way that in a way that kind of adds something to the impact for the reader? So everything's layered, right? You, you kind mm -hmm. of you have the script, and then the and then the penciler comes in and kind of builds onto that layer. Inca comes and builds on top of that layer. The colorist comes and builds on top of that layer. And, and lettering, I think, needs to kind of do the same thing, kind of build on top of that layer, add a little bit to the story, but kind of just finish off the, the complete graphic package. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because, for example, uh, you talk about something that's really important. And, uh, for example, um, this is something that I actually, I believe I was listening uh, yesterday to the latest episode of Letters and Lines um, right. and, uh, about the, the, the process in, in that you are working with, for example, with, with ideas. And, for example, uh, you, you can have uh, bad art that if it's communicating the, the right idea, it's, it's actually doing its job. It's more important to have that than having beautiful art that doesn't communicate uh, anything at all. And for example, legibility, and as we mentioned, it, it's not just from the letters, it's also actually from the images in there. Uh, we can uh, take uh, another example from uh, from recent work, in this case, is uh, from Black Stars Above. Uh, right. uh, uh, saludos, uh, Loni and uh, Jena, uh, some, some, some shout out to them. Uh, we actually had an interview with uh, both of them, and that's why I feel like I, I, I have been contacting you. Uh, uh, in, uh, I should have contacted you before because you are obviously part of this. <laughs> team and we have uh, the, in this in this way part of the design that you were mentioning that it comes even from the from the uh, the name of the title and also when you are reading the uh, in in this case uh, we are having a story that is located in the past uh, that it's uh, taking place in, in the ta in, in the past in, in Canada and perhaps for, for some for some new readers it can be a little bit uh, difficult to read in this case this kind of uh, hand handwritten style but it's actually adequate it, it helps you to get into the mood in this case of the story obviously we have in this case uh, uh, part of the dialogues the sound effects uh, uh, one question do you also work with the sound effects or this is more like uh, the artist or, or is a combination uh, of both 
Those the, ones, yeah, the, the sound effects and black stars were me, yeah. Okay, uh, that, that's something that I, I was uh, wondering. And once again, we, we get into the, the, the part of the story where we are actually uh, getting to the point where we are understanding that we're reading part of a diary. So in this case, okay, that explains, it's perhaps a really simple example of, of or a straightforward example where we can see how part of, uh, how everything is, it's a combination of, of a particular idea. So I just wanted to show some of the, of these pictures to to illustrate and also to to send a shout out to uh, Lonnie and, and and Jenna for the wonderful work that you all guys uh, have done with, at least with the well not 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 only with it, the, with this title but with all the collaborations and long words that you had so I really enjoyed this black as I say black stars was a was a um, a really interesting one because it's there's there's quite a lot of of sort of specific elements in there like the diary stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but also just like the, the I, I wanted to, this was my first time I've let a, a Jenna on like a, like a couple of little shorts and stuff as mm -hmm. well since then. Um, but the thing that I w really liked about black stars was trying to create like a, something about her art style when I first saw it, that felt, and, and because of the, the, the sort of time it was set in that I wanted to kind of make it feel a little bit like almost like wood cuttings or something. Mm -hmm. So the balloons have a kind of pale yellow, the font is a bit kind of um it's quite straight and, and quite serious mm -hmm. which i wanted to, and which i really liked for the effect um and also the, i thought that would play really nicely against the, the the looser sort of cursive um diary stuff so again it's like it's just little stuff like i don't you know i don't know how much of this necessarily specifically translates i don't think people mm -hmm. the, the, the intention is not for someone to read it and say oh he, there's a contrast between the loose, the loose <laughs> cursive and the straight edge of the of the dialogue font. Mm -hmm. But I, I, but I think I think I will I, at least I hope that it, that it comes across the, the difference in in the way that those two are, are kind of structured. And I think, um, I think that we we in, you know we infer a lot from graphic design. I think there is a mm -hmm. lot of lettering that, or at least in the design element of lettering, there is a lot of that graphic design principle that comes through. So there's, there's just trying that com try to communicate something that makes it. Because I think if if I just lettered this book with you know regular oval white white balloons, um, I just it, I just it just wouldn't have the same impact to me. I think there's mm -hmm. a there's a kind of sort of a slight seriousness to the to the sort of the, the more sort of rectangular balloons uh, and the font. So it's it's like that's that's kind of like a lot of choices are made in that stage that will impact the kind of the rest of the book. And that, that's so for me that's why it's so important to get the design part right early on. All right. And uh, uh, talking about design, let's move a little bit in, more into the, in this case, perhaps the, the design of uh, being used uh, by this particular language. And uh, we have, uh, for example, some some classic styles like the one that we are looking at is the the, the nine panel grid. That it's. Uh, <laughs> I was actually uh, joking with the, with Lonnie at the time and telling him like, uh, this is a formula that you use if you want to get nominated by an Eisner. <laughs> so and uh, well of course it has been uh, used by by various degrees of success uh, but it's actually uh, perhaps like um, I don't know uh, how to put it like the one of the um, layouts that are more efficient uh, when you want to talk about uh, about uh, different kind of stories obviously this has evolved for example I remember that, that I believe it was in the middle 90s or late 90s where the approach for comic books was a little bit more uh, cinematographic, where you have uh, huge splash pages where you wanted to show more uh, when you mm -hmm. use uh, the layout. Like if uh, when you were opening a page, uh, it, it was more like a scene, scene from, from a film instead of mm -hmm. a, a, a page layout in here. Uh, can you tell us or can you um, comment a little bit about the uh, perhaps the evolution in this case in the comic medium? Because when we read... Um, some classic comics, comics from the 40s and 50s, uh, it had a different purpose. And then we have uh, perhaps the, the, the evolution in, in the 80s, 90s. And then we have, uh, I dare to say, the, the, the teenage years uh, in the 90s, uh, when pretty much everything was more focused on the images. So uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how uh, comic language uh, have been, has been evolving in the storytelling? Yeah, I think... The, the the big one in terms of like like you were talking about in terms of the the kind of like the widescreen uh what what we call what we sort of end up being coined like the the sort of cinematic visuals is, mm -hmm. is really interesting because there's those 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 visuals are, are less useful in my opinion when it comes to comics i think the reason why the nine panel grid works quite effectively is you end up sitting in in rows of three tiers 
Uh, mm-hmm. And each tier has and each tier has three panels, which harkens back to kind of like the three, four panel strips of, of kind of newspaper strips. Um, it also gives you a really nice beat a beat setup of kind of like a beginning, middle, and end on almost on every single tier. If you look at Darwin Cook stuff, he uses mm. um, those he uses those tiers often specifically like that, where each tier kind of ends on a specific story beat, or, or you know, or, or at least a narrative beat within the overall story beat of the page. Um, but the, also the other nice thing about nine, two extra nice things about nine panel grids is that you have a center panel, which is useful from a design uh, perspective, because you end up having a visual that almost everything else on the page kind of revolves around. And that I think the nine is essentially the only panel you get that with. Um, if you go 16, you lose it. If you go eight, you lose it, which can also be quite useful too. Uh, but specifically nine gives you a central point that you can revolve a page around. Um, and it also then gives you... Uh, uh, height, which is important in comics, because the difference between a cinema cinema screen uh, being widescreen and a panel being widescreen is that a cinema screen doesn't have to fit balloons in it. Um, the the text comes uh, in a separate as a set as a separate thing. Whereas in in comics, if you have a widescreen panel, you've got to you potentially got to lose about a third of that to balloons, and so you're kind of cramming people's heads kind of even even smaller into a panel. Whereas a nine panel grid gives you height. And so you can take the top third of a nine panel grid and use it for your dialogue and captions and that sort of thing without losing really any impact on your uh, composition. So there's a reason why nine panel grids beyond um, an, like allusions to Watchmen, there's a reason why they are, they're they actually genuinely quite a useful um, structure. And the nice thing that structure gives you generally uh, in whatever grid form you want it to have, eight panel grids, four panel grids, whatever it is, the nice thing those, those, they give you is they give you a rigid structure to storytelling. Uh, I was having a conversation with Aditya, who's the my co-host on Letters and Lines, um, and he was talking, I think, I don't know if we mentioned it in the latest episode or not, but he was talking to Darcy, who's the writer of Little Bird that he worked on, and discussing the idea that like, if a nine-panel grid specifically, but grids more likely, are quite useful in terms of relating to cinematic. And it, that it kind of depends what you term cinematic as. But cinematic in terms of control, a grid like the nine-panel grid gives you so much control over pace. Because you really, you really, in that format, really do have a tight, tight control, especially from a writer's perspective. You know much more what you're going to get from your finished page um, as a writer in a nine-panel grid than you do if you just wrote five panels and just said to your artist, kind of do whatever. It's it's a difficult uh, pacing structure uh, when you're not sat in a rigid grid because you kind of don't know what the page is actually going to look like until you, you see the pencils come back. Whereas at least in the grid format, you can kind of have an idea of how that thing's going to get plotted and laid out. Um, so cinematic. So what we had, what we had early on back in the sort of golden age of superheroes, you saw a lot of six-panel grids, which are really nice. Which are also really, really nice grids. Uh, two, you know, two by three. So two panels, two panels, two panels, um, and they're quite useful in terms of giving you kind of beat on, beat off, beat on, beat off, beat on, beat off. Which is also what um, Lapham, David Lapham, uses in Stray Bullets on an eight-panel grid, just with an extra two panels. Um, and then as that that kind of structure evolved, and I think a lot of that came from just ease of ease of um, ease of drawing you know you, you were talking back in the day when people would be drawing a lot quicker than they draw now mm-hmm. um very very structured pages um and then once we got to kind of like you got to like the kind of 80s 90s you start to see the the rise of the superstar artists right especially in the kind of like mid to late 90s um and that's when you started getting artists that were kind of in full control over a, over a comic um in, I'm talking like, you know, like Marvel kind of things. You mm-hmm, have like mm-hmm. a Liefeld and Jim Lee, that sort of stuff. And so you started getting much more bombastic visuals where they were they were kind of like playing to their strengths of, of what they did well, which was often kind of really superheroic, masculine um, forms and figures and really kind of like bursting out of pages, like a, a, like a Rob Liefeld comic mm-hmm. of just people bursting out of panels constantly. Everyone's got giant muscles and they're throwing each other around. And so structure kind of went out the window a little bit in favor of bombast and then what we found was that once cinema started becoming more of a a a, a thing we were more literate in you know with, with the advent of home movies and stuff like that you started getting that the, the the summer blockbuster coming in then you started to find that that kind of language infiltrated comics stuff like the ultimates mm-hmm. where you had hitch's kind of big widescreen visuals and big splash visuals that that was very much kind of like that grounded sort of summer blockbuster action movie kind of style. Um, and what I think we're getting to now, or at least the stuff that I'm kind of gravitating more and I see more and more now, is the more sort of um, kind of cartooned, you know, the David Ayer, the Tyler Boss kind of style stuff, uh, Erica Henderson, where you're you're kind of leaning into 
the kind of slightly more cartoon quality that people like Darwin Cook had, you know, and, and Eisner had back in the day. Um, and we're kind of going full form away from that kind of grounded realism and back to what comics kind of does especially well. Um, that's from my that's from my lim that's from my limited uh, ex perspective. That's how I kind of see the the kind of arcs go. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because, uh, uh, for example, I was looking for some examples to illustrate in this case, and uh, one of the classics, uh, I don't know if we can call it in there, uh, but the, one of the classic styles in this case is uh, from Brian Hitch that you already mentioned from The Ultimates. And it, uh, at least uh, for that time, uh, it, uh, for me, popularized the, 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 this kind of storytelling. But as you yeah. mentioned, uh, it, it, it can look like... Uh, a, block, a blockbuster movie, but uh, it's like, okay, every panel has to be uh, something that uh, has uh, uh, impact in the reader. Uh, but uh, obviously different artists have different pers perspectives. You can adapt it and still use the, the uh, wide screen uh, panel layout if, uh, if you combine it, uh, combine it uh, properly in there. But something that you mentioned in there is that perhaps you you don't uh, you are uh, not missing a part, but uh, perhaps not using the like in this case that we have in a comic with Moon Knight, the the mm -hmm. the, the the time frame that you can um, use. Uh, in this kind of approach, as, as you mentioned, you have something that is anchoring you, and then you have the different movements. And uh, you have other other parts where you are uh, taking uh, other pages where perhaps you can play more with the, the, the way that time is happening. And uh, yes, you can get nine panels wh when you have uh, used the face of, of a person. I remember that this was something like in the Spider-Man comics in the, in the 90s. And uh, then you have uh, the, the evolution, and then you... you you could say perhaps you can use more like a bendis like style where you have a huge page uh, with just one image and then you have different uh, thought uh, balloons or different dialogues in there and you can transmit uh, this kind of uh, time passing in this kind of picture. But uh, after all, it's it's uh, the way that the artists want to express it, but it's something that you can use different means in the same page how to express it in there. So it's something that's really interesting. After all, it's cheaper to have just a page and just draw the ideas that you have it in there and try to express it uh, in combination with the rest of the team uh, than perhaps just taking a picture. In, in a picture, you are just uh, looking for something that looks nice. Yes, you can also look for something that ha have uh, a deeper meaning, but in this case, you have a, a cheaper tool to do it because after all, well, a patient, a pencil, it's something that you can get pretty much get uh, at a lower cost in, in, in this case. This is, well, this is something that we talked about on the on the, the latest Letters and Lines episode, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, is an interesting one because you're, there, there is an element of, I mean, like one thing that you mentioned earlier that we talked about on that was the idea of a good illustration versus a good sequential mm -hmm. uh, page. And those two things aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, you can have a good illustration that's, that works well in a, in a sort of sequential, se uh, you know, in a, in a sequence, but it doesn't necessarily, just because something is, is drawn well, doesn't necessarily make it a good uh, image for a comic. I, I uh, had the absolute delight of listening to Brian Stelfreeze um, go through a whole bunch of his kind of like his uh, his rules for what makes good comic art. And that was one thing he really hammered home. You know, one thing he said was he's like, I've got comics on my shelf that I open and I look at and they're beautiful, but I don't read them. <laughs> and because I don't, I don't, I don't read them because they don't want me to read them. They're, they're, they're almost, they're drawn in the way where they want you to go, look how beautiful this is. Look at what a great bit of draftsmanship this is. But they're not designed the way where it goes, okay, let me take you to the next bit of story. Let me take you to the next bit of story. Let me give you, let me give you some emotion in this. Um, and one thing that Aditya sort of said on that episode of Letters and Lines was in Western comics, we we very much, there is a very much of an emphasis on that kind of bombast, right? On that kind of idea of uh, a good a good image is one that has um, a lot of lines or one that is particularly realistic or one that is um, drawn, draw, kind of drawn incredibly well. And it works well for, you know, sharing on social media and stuff like that, taking a single image and and kind of throwing it up and saying, look how incredible this thing is. But it also needs to work as part of a longer sequence. And that's one thing I think we we especially saw in in uh, older comics when they were being drawn a lot quicker, was efficiency became a, a massive tool. And with efficiency came the idea of what was important and what isn't important. And uh, I love this idea from, this was from Ganzir in, in an issue of Panel by Panel, where he talked about like the efficiency idea is, when when do I need to stop drawing? Like, at what point does a panel has a panel achieved its narrative purpose? And at what point am I just drawing to make the image look better, or you know, or, or whatever, or more detailed? Um, and that each line needs to have a kind of uh, a purpose in the panel. 
And if you hit a point where that line is no longer adding narrative value, maybe you're drawing too much in that image. Um, and so I really like I really like that idea of of kind of the illustrative versus the the narrative and, and and kind of the balance between the two. That I've gone off on a little tangent again. I, I'm going to do this every time you <laughs> you ask a question, but I, I find that kind of balance quite. Uh, particularly interesting as it sort of relates to comics. Mm -hmm. And for example, something that you mentioned before, it's uh, about the, the the part of the work that you have to do in the in, in the design. And it, I believe that it has been taking more uh, more of a spotlight there recently. And uh, uh, for example, we have cases in in commercial comic books uh, that uh, Jonathan Hickman uh, helped to popularize. I remember then uh, the first titles that I read from here, the, the nightly nightly new, news uh, from Image. I love the way that he yep. was uh, using and he was both the designer, well, the designer, the artist, and the writer in, in that case. And for example, for the the, the work that he has, uh, I can either to say standardizing the X Men, uh, the, uh, you have to work a lot with this kind of um, documentary style. I believe that you you have called it uh, that way, uh, where you have uh, not only the 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 pictures in this case, the dialogues, but you also get more information in in uh, in, in a way that it, it can make you lazy if you don't want to to read about it. But it's it's actual information that is going to complement uh, the story that you are reading uh, in this case. And obviously you have the, the, the design of credit that it's something that perhaps if you have been working in, in, in movies, it's something that uh, used to be not um, not as uh, important in, in some aspects. If you get a Woody Allen movie, for example, the, the credits uh, can be quite simple and you just get the letters after letters with the names of the characters. But then you have uh, the, the, the intro credits that are every time more elaborated. And in this case, uh, I, I see some uh, reference in this case with this ki kind of comics where you put a more emphasis in this case that if you are going to show the names in this case of the team that is working on the comic book let's do it in a way that it's actually uh, helps you helps you because it can give you like some sort of a pause uh, some some moments so you can reflect before before getting into the story I think I think the, the, the stuff with the, the kind of design this it comes down there's a couple of reasons but I think it comes down to like the idea of uh, of, of product and um, of a unit right so a single issue. I think we did it in Undone by Blood, where mm -hmm. the end of I don't know. We may maybe not for the last couple of issues, but at least in the first few, that the end of the the, the issue was a, a couple of pages of like prose, so as mm -hmm. though it was taken out of the the kind of the Western book and put at the end. And it comes down to how you want to see the the single issue, right? You've got like the if you look at stuff by you know Brew Baker and Phillips, they they'll end with a, with a bunch of essays. If you look at Bitter Root, they end with um, John Jennings' stuff has got a. Uh, uh, he handles the back matter with essays and that kind of thing, and it's about creating a an experience with a single issue that is beyond beyond the just the narrative story because it's like an experience at, and and making that m sort of more worth the investment necessarily than than uh, maybe another comic on the shelf. But th there's so there's that there's that element of it which is I want you to buy this this single issue for four dollars rather than maybe wait six months or eight months or whatever for a collection. <laughs> Uh, or, or pick a different comic next to it on the shelf that maybe looks more enticing. Like, I want to give you value for the dollars that you're spending. But also, from like the X-Men example, I think, is a little bit more a case of we've got 20 pages of story, uh, and that's our, that's, our, that's our budget for that issue. But I want to get a bit more in there for you, and I don't want to necessarily overload the comic page with tons of exposition and dialogue. Mm -hmm. So what else can I do? And you can add a few more pages to the comic, and adding a few more design pages is substantially cheaper than adding a few more narrative pages. It, it's also easier on people's deadlines and that sort of thing. But you know, if you're paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars to have a page uh, penciled, inked, colored, and lettered, uh, but really what you want to just add is flavor for the world, then you can do that in a different way. Like we, when we did Protector at Image, um, Simon Roy and Daniel Benson, Artem Trakhanov, um, we had, you know, we had we had kind of like an encyclopedia stuff at the end of each issue that took you that took you into the world a little bit more. You didn't need to read it to understand the, the kind of A to B narrative plot points, but it added something to your experience. It gave you a bit more depth to the world, um, and it was designed in a way that felt like an encyclopedia as well. It felt it felt like something that existed in the world rather than just like someone's open word document where they just put their ideas down. So you kind of designing stuff that feels like it's part of the world, which is very much like what Hickman's X-Men thing is. So that when you open the issue, you are, even though you stop reading comic and start reading uh, prose, essentially, mm -hmm. you're still like in the world of that comic. So you can you can end the scene and then have a, have a, a narrative sort of prose page, 
and then go back into the comic without it feeling at all jarring because everything from the from the inside opening of the credits and everything all the way through to the end of the story is in the same you know it's in the same world even if it's not the same medium if that makes sense and i i, I really like that like hickman does it on on like black monday murders and stuff too mm -hmm. where you'll be interrupted but it still feels like it's part of the it still feels like you're, you're part of the world it doesn't feel like you've you've jumped out of the comic for a moment and then gone back into the comic but the classic example is watchmen you know at the end of each mm -hmm. chapter of watchmen there's Maybe there's an excerpt from a novel or whatever it is, um, and it's and it and it's designed in a way where it still feels like you are in this world, which is which is like I think vital to make those things work. Um, but it, for me, it's just it's just a really clever way of giving someone a little bit more of your world, a little bit more of your story, without losing them, and also without uh, costing more money and more time on the creative team <laughs> to make those extra pages work. Yeah, yeah. And for example, as you mentioned, the, the most important thing is that it doesn't take you away. Yeah? You feel that it's part uh, right. of, of, of the story, because uh, if not, you perhaps you could feel like it's like, uh, I don't know, like the, the letter section at the end that perhaps it, it can refer <laughs> to a previous thing, uh, pre something that was previously published, but is not yeah. uh, as uh, as integral to the part. And uh, perhaps you think, okay, I just spent, I don't know, $2.99, $3.99, uh, $4.99, which are the most uh, common prices right now uh, in US dollars yeah. to a comic book. And then you feel like, well, uh, thank you very much but it was just 20 pages and uh, the rest were just things that weren't uh, helpful to under for understanding the story and then you have uh, another example i don't know if you have read um this comic it was published i believe uh, uh, a couple of months ago or one month ago by jesse lonergan hedra published by Jimash. yeah which is yeah, it, it's, it's something wonderful because uh, we have talked about the language, we have talked about the different elements that are uh, integral to the storytelling in this medium, but something that um, I haven't uh, seen in, in quite a long time is the way that he's pacing the story using, obviously, the, the diagram, the way that he's mm -hmm. uh, pacing a any of the elements and integrating, in this case, yes, we have the credits uh, page from Image, but every single panel, even though you can say that there are a bunch of uh, blue boxes uh, in the story are actually part of the plot and let you breathe, let you understand part of the of, mm -hmm. of the narrative. And for me, it was like, okay, you, you can uh, understand the story if you read it just once. But then uh, it's like, uh, okay, hold on a second. Now I have to read it again at least uh, twice or three times because uh, all the elements uh, are setting a, a different pace that I haven't seen in comic books in quite a long time. So I just love the, the, the way that uh, this, this particular work uh, uses uh, the comic medium as something that uh, perhaps uh, a lot of people weren't aware, and I include myself, that it could do. Yes, we know that it has pictures. We know that you are telling a story, but uh, it was something that blew my mind when I, I had the, the chance to check it. What did you think when you saw this uh, particular comic? Yeah, I loved it. I, do you know, it reminded me of... Um... Uh, there's a there's a, 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 um, a comics creator and also a, a teacher called Nick Susanis. Mm -hmm. And um, Nick does a really cool, uh, he has a cool uh, blog called Spin, Weave and Cut. And he one of the things he does there is kind of detail his his sort of like teaching methods and um, and some of the uh, sort of little things that him that his students do, some of the exercises his students do. And one of them is, a, one of them I, I absolutely love is this exercise where he gets you to think about how you would break down your day uh, or a memory of a time or whatever, but only using empty panels. So you have, if you've got a, a, a standard page and you're trying to kind of um, examine the way that your day felt, but only with blank panels. So essentially just with rectangles, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe, you know, maybe the morning felt like loads of little rectangles. And then there was something that happened, like you met up with someone and it just felt like one giant space. Um, and that's what Hedra felt like to me. It felt like it felt like that, an examination of of... Um, time as contained in panels, because that's essentially what we, you know, that's mm -hmm. essentially what makes comics, right? As a sequence of a sequence of, of small boxes. Um, but it's also about how those boxes relate to each other, both in size and scope. The, the the standard rule that I hear a lot from from artists when we do interviews in panel by panel is that a bigger panel means something is more important. The thing that Nick sort of wants to examine when he does that uh, study, I think, um, that exercise is. Is it what does what does bigger actually like? What does it mean though? So it means more important, but what does that mean? Does it mean uh, more time? Does it mean uh, time feels bigger? Does it you know? It, and, and the nice thing is, it means kind of that and everything else. And so it's I think that's what really got me excited when I read that was this is someone who's kind of almost like taken that approach 
and and almost like you know kind of almost taken uh, Nick's uh, exercise and mm-hmm. done just done this kind of whole comic exploration around what what do we mean when we think of a panel like what does a panel do what is what are its attributes how does it connect with another panel next to it so like you've got some pa- you've got some pages in that where it's a single scene but broken up through numerous panels and so the, it seems to be asking a question of what does this mean like does this mean we're seeing time kind of unravel does it mean we're seeing this scene kind of play out over you know 15 15 moments 15 seconds 15 minutes whatever whatever you kind of want to attribute the length of one panel to be um and the nice thing is that for me it got me started thinking about that because it's I, I thought about that and my my question was what does a panel how long does a panel last and so does a panel of just like the example you've got here does a panel of just pink last any more or less time than one that contains a bit of rubble or one that contains a bit of mountain and if it does what does that mean in terms of the size as a unit of time because if size doesn't mean a different unit of time if it means a large unit, you know, it, then it becomes what does the contents of a panel mean? And so I spent a, a good, I spent a good like three days just just doing that in my head uh, constantly as I was flicking through it. <laughs> it just got some, that sort of thing just gets me really excited because it, I think what I like to what I get really into in terms of like mediums and storytelling is is trying to decipher like how do you adapt and how do you use it and what are the attributes and it, are those attributes flexible or are they not flexible? Because there's some things that we take for granted, like we take for granted the size of a of a of a cinema screen, mm-hmm. um, that the, the it's just a six you know a, a, a well we let's say TV a sixteen by nine box, but it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be that big. You can do a one one square, mm-hmm. um, you can do you can do a thin tiny you know Lawrence of Arabia cinema scope. You can and so the moment that you realize that the things that you accept as flexible are not actually fle- uh, sorry the things that you accept as rigid are not actually rigid but are flexible. Then you can start to think, well, what does what can I do to unpick that, and then how can that help my narrative? So, in the comic that we're talking about, uses space and time so much. So much about that is about empty space, empty time, and the passing of time, the loneliness, and then connection. And so, by under, by Jesse kind of like seeing that and thinking, well, what does what does the, what are the attributes of a panel, and how do I make that more flexible? You can then use that to explore the themes of your comic. And if you you couldn't tell that same story. Uh, if you told that same story, but you did a different approach, you didn't use these really heavy sort of um, square grids, it, would, it just wouldn't have the same feeling. If you drew each of those moments without grids and just left them as big empty panels and big expanses, it wouldn't ask you to think about the way that those images are presented in the same way. And so your interaction with that story would be quite different. And therefore, your emotional connection to that story would be quite different. Um, and so that's the thing that I always find fascinating is this is done in a particular way. Why was it done like that? What, what, what am I, what, and what does that say about the medium itself? That's again. I'm. You keep. I'm. I keep going off on, on tangents. But uh, no, no. But it's it's all relevant actually the to the point of, of of discussion. And for example, uh, this uh, if, if we're uh, we were to draw perhaps some some parallelism uh, with the I don't know uh, with the audiovisual medium with uh, some sort of uh, cinema genre. Uh, we have, for example, uh, well, this is something that we have. Um, I, I know that it's a style that is not uh, just uh, being executed here in Mexico, but we have the uh, film festival cinema or, well, the, the, the kind of movies that you can only watch on cinema or cine right. festivalero, which usually are slow pace uh, where you have long shots that, for example, uh, can take you, I don't know, five minutes from uh, moving the camera to one point to the next where nothing is happening. And it's right. kind of interesting because it, in a way it's they are using the same kind of... Um, uh, uh, they are dealing in a similar way with time, uh, with the only difference that, for example, when you are having moving pictures, well, they are moving, and you need time to actually give you the pace. And in this case, you, uh, as uh, with the pace that we have uh, right now in here, you have the entire space, and you are getting the entire message at the very moment that you are opening the page. By turning the page, you, yep. you you know what is happening, but then you are like, okay, I am supposed to be uh, paying, as you mentioned before. Two seconds per square, yes and no. I mean, it's something that it's part of the of the creative process in this in this in this way. But if you were to translate this particular scene to something, to a movie, to a to a video sequence, uh, yes, uh, you can perhaps add a, a something that will look more like a still frame from the space, but the, uh, it will set you in a different position. In there, uh, the the artist has more control about uh, if he wants to. To, to bore you if he wants to make you angry, uh, depending on the kind of image that you are showing, because it's not mm-hmm. the same in this case, so, uh, perhaps showing a scene of um, a still frame of, uh, of the night sky, 
uh, that if you are looking at the violent uh, scene where perhaps somebody is uh, hitting somebody and the more that you are spending with this particular image the more that it's uh, it feels more uncomfortable so it's it's different times and it also depends the kind of control that you want to have with the message that you are delivering so it's something that uh, mm -hmm. it, there are so many ways of using it <laughs> well this i think that the thing with this is like there there is a, there is sto there are stories where the the structure in the presentation mm -hmm. is designed to be invisible. Mm -hmm. And there are stories where the, the structure and presentation is integral to the experience. Um, or rather, or rather the, the, the structure in the approach is specifically the experience. So you can go see, a, um, uh, you know, you can watch a, a mainstream Hollywood blockbuster or whatever. And that film never wants you to become aware of the fact that you're sat watching a film. It, it rarely mm -hmm. wants you to, to remember that you're sat in a dark cinema. Whereas you can watch uh you can you can go see like a, an art house film or whatever that is kind of drawing attention to the fact that you are watching artifice mm -hmm. um and i think with hedger what you, what you've got is you've got a, a comic that is very slight in its in its story right the, the story itself is very very thin um but what it's asking you to do in terms of you know what actually happens is quite is quite uh minimal but what it's asking you to do is engage with it in a very very different way than just reading it from start to finish and just taking in the story it's not because it's not it's not about that mm -hmm. um and so the, all, all of those kind of things play into the way that you're going to interact with the with the comic and that's one thing like going back to lettering as well that's that's a thing uh i've talked a lot about undone by blood but i'll mention it again that's like a kind of a thing in uh, undone by blood that you're there are elements of that where we want you to go from a to b and just work your way through the story but there are also elements of that where we want you to stop and notice something and sometimes that's as small as um you know a flashback sequence if you see a flashback sequence and maybe it's colored in, in you know monochromatic or it's uh, got a one strong red or whatever um, and everything else is black and white you know like a sin city style that is that is a moment like hedra where the comic is asking you to notice something that is not necessarily narrative so mm -hmm. it's not asking you to, to understand who's saying what or the fact that that person just pushed someone or whatever it's asking you to understand that this is portrayed differently um, and the nice thing about comics and this is something that i think i like on strip pile naked I, I talk about all the time is that the very nature of comics is designed to not be real. Like, you, you, I don't think at any point is anyone reading a comic and thinking like, oh, well, this is, I'm watching a real event play out in real time. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not what comics are, 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 are trying to do. Whereas you could go watch a film, you could go watch uh, Avengers, and you can see Chris Evans in a Captain America costume moving 24 frames a second, and you could absolutely sit back in your chair and believe that that is real because you are seeing reality you're seeing a real mm -hmm. person um whereas comics doesn't have that so i think with comics the fun thing is that you can you can just do whatever you want in any way shape or form like undone by blood can can cut mid-page and then turn to a completely different style become a western all of a sudden with a different now with different narrative captions with different dialogue captions with different coloring uh and you don't go oh that's weird that that's not reality you just say, "Yep, yeah, that's that's where we've gone now," and we carry on. And there's a there's a there's a, a beauty to that that allows you to tell stories in completely different ways than anything else does. Like the example with Hedger, you know, you couldn't translate that to another medium because to, if you, well, I mean, the the very way it exists and the whole thing it's interrogating as a, as a story is comics itself anyway. But what that what it's doing so much there is drawing constant attention to its form. And it can only get away with doing that, I think, because you already understand that it's it's an artificial product that you're reading. If you saw a film like that that was constantly jarring and cutting and causing attention to the very forms, and the, and you know pe you were being pointed out constantly to the edge of the frame and how the whole thing existed, all it's doing is breaking your immersion. Whereas I don't think in Hedra and in comics generally that when you draw attention to its form, it necessarily breaks the immersion in any way near the way it would do in in in, uh, in film. Um, and that's one of those things that I love. I love seeing explored more and more in comics. Another, another great thing about a comic as well is it just it just never breaks what it's doing, even though it constantly is making you aware of the fact <laughs> that it's doing that. Yeah, it depends a lot of, of, of the medium. And as you mentioned, if if a director that there are directors that do that, and I have been mm. uh, working, at, for mm. example, in advertisement, and it's it, perhaps it's not intentional, but it, it feels like a stop. And hey, look at me! This is awesome, right? And it's like, well, right. yeah, 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 cool, uh, cool. It's a reference to Hitchcock, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's fun, fun to know that. But uh, it, it's 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 the way that you actually can develop the story in, in different medium. As and as you mentioned, uh, without taking you away, in this case, from 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 the story. 
But uh, unfortunately, we are pretty much uh, getting to the end of, of this conversation. And man, uh, hopefully we can get you again too, because this is something that we can keep talking and I could keep listening to you for hours and hours. Luckily, there are different places where we actually can uh, can do that. And you have uh, been mentioning, for example, you can find in pretty much every podcast app, Letters and Lines, uh, a collaborative effort that you are doing uh, in this case. And uh, wh what can we hear about in the different episodes that you have in this series, uh, Haras? Yeah, it's it's it, uh, letters and lines of the podcast I do with Aditya Bidikar, who's a mm. an incredible, incredible letterer. Um, and we talk about lettering because we both letter, so we spend a lot of the time talking about lettering. But also, we're we you know we uh, Aditya writes for panel by panel uh, very often, so we talk about kind of comics from a critical point of view, from a lettering point of view, but also just from being fans of the medium as well. So it's about sixty to ninety minutes of mm -hmm. just us getting far too in depth into lettering and making comics. <laughs> there you have it in case that you want to uh, hear, most, hear more, more about it uh, you can find it pretty much everywhere where, where podcasts are available if you are not a podcast person guess what you can also have in YouTube I know that you kids know what is the, the YouTube well perhaps you are more worried about the TikTok that you must be recording for, for later but uh, there you can fa have uh, some of the most interesting analysis of uh Uh, comic book uh, language that I have uh, seen in, in, in lo a long, long time. And I love the way that you have been uh, dissecting, uh, in this case, different elements that uh, are present in, in, in the comic book. And the latest episode was uh, Creating Clean Action? No. Yes, I believe that it was. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. There you have it. So a strip, a strip naked, naked uh, panel in YouTube. Sorry, you were about to say something. No, I was just going to say, yeah, with that, we I, I, very occasionally I get uh, creators on there as well. That was with Andre Araujo. Mm -hmm. There you have it. And in case that you want to read something, it's really easy to get, uh, for example, panel by panel. Let me see if actually we can do it. The late, I, I, I must confess that I haven't got the, the latest issue. So let's see. Uh, three bucks, don't worry. You can check up. And I'm going to uh, move the... <laughs> <laughs> so you don't get my information. But uh, da, 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 da. this is the way that we do a live show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please charge my, my secret code. It's four, five, six. No, what? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, da, da, da. I'm doing the music. Okay, there you are. Yes, it's warning me that it's going to charge me. But uh, oh, I have to add my email address. I, I thought that it was going to um, uh, add it to my PayPal account. But don't worry. Do you have a, an offer code that I can use? Don't worry, I, I will pay full. <laughs> <laughs> Because it was asking me for that. And as you see, guys, uh, it's really simple. And there you have it. I finally bought it and I uh, can view the content. And uh, I, you have been promoting this issue because it was actually released last week, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It just came out uh, the Wednesday just gone. Uh, so we do, we do one issue every month. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're $3. Um, they're about 100, 110 pages, something like that. Um, And yeah, they're, they're just huge, far too big, far too long. But I, I want to make sure that people kind of get their money's worth. But yeah, it's just some of the best writing about comics, I think, from some really, really, like, really fantastic uh, writers and creators. And we get, we one thing I really like in this is that we get really in-depth interviews with creators. So like the the interview with the Bitterroot team is like 20 pages long. It's really, it gets really quite in-depth with the team. But also the, we do, um, features that aren't related to the the cover the cover comic so there's loads of stuff in there that isn't about bitterroot so if you haven't read bitterroot then there's still like 50 60 pages of uh interviews with creators of essays of, of analysis from different people um and uh yeah i, I, don't know, I think it's really good we we, we won an eisner i should probably say that might make people think it's good <laughs> there you have it but uh, i actually have been uh, strongly recommending i have also a podcast uh, i do with uh, some friends about uh, focus mainly on, co on comic books and for example i love the the batman issue that i believe it was like uh, half year ago something like that so don't worry in case that uh, you don't uh, want perhaps uh, to read something that it's uh, more specialized uh, you have uh, a different issues uh, uh, focused on genre focused on characters so there you have it you can find it at panel uh, by panel so and it's a magazine that I believe that it's uh, actually, I believe that it's not really important. I mean, you won an Eisner, right? For for the work that you have been doing there, so. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, so that, I think that means it's all right. <laughs> exactly. So there you have it. And in case that people want to contact you or perhaps just uh, give me a shout out, they also can find you on Twitter, right? Yeah, I'm on there too much. 
<laughs> okay, so there you have it. Uh, you, you will also have uh, the links in, in, in the post where we're publishing this uh, particular episode. And uh, we are ending uh, this transmission. Thanks to everybody who was connected watching in here. And uh, especially thanks to you, Has, uh, for accepting the invitation. And hopefully we, we will get the chance to talk uh, in the not so, not so far future about comics and uh, storytelling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you. It's been a uh, really good time. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thanks. And thanks to the patrons who are making possible this, this episode. And uh, you will see their names in the end credits.